All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. It is Thursday, July 22nd, 2021, and we are live. So I wanted to uh, do a preview of a exciting new online course that I'm teaching, a 10-week online course. Uh, this class starts Saturday, July 24th, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is uh, from the Civil War to Civil Rights and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. From the Civil War to Civil Rights and Black Power, from 1865 to 1968. And this is going to be a 10-week online course uh, that I teach. And each week we're going to look at uh, this meets uh, 10 consecutive Saturdays. Each week we'll look at a an approximately 10 year period of history uh, starting in 1865. Uh, we have the Civil War, 13th Amendment, uh, 40 Acres and the Mule, Special Field Order number 15. Uh, so we'll go through the Reconstruction Era and we'll look at a, an approximately 10 year period of history each class to see how we got to where we are today. All right. And I'm going to do an overview of uh, of the online course. All right. Uh, you can register for this class at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And then also uh, uh, so you, you can register there and we'll post a link here. Also, uh, we do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. And you can go back and watch uh, the course over and over again. OK, even after the course is over, you'll still have access to the course content. All right. And I do a I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, et cetera. But to understand where we are today, how we got to this place and, and, and what the next steps are, where do we go from here? We have to understand the history of how we got here. All right. And this is one of the reasons why this history is being attacked uh, by Republican state legislatures. And you have the attack on the 1619 project, attack on critical race theory, um, et cetera. All right. You have uh, a lot of people who don't want us to understand this history. And this all ties into politics as well. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power and resources and the writing of law, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Okay, so we have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, right on the home homepage. Uh, when you scroll down, you'll see the information for my radio show. We're six days a week. You'll see the information for the uh, new online course. Click here, register here. It takes you to the next page and click on enroll. As soon as you register, you start watching bonus content and uh, you'll be ready for class uh, on Saturday, uh, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Click right here to enroll, all right? So I want to uh, pull up the PowerPoint presentation here. Everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in as well. All right, so this is a preview of from the Civil War to the Civil Rights, uh, to Civil Rights and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Uh, um, let's see here. Anytime I speak, I know I may say some things that are sad as a comments of some people's awareness. So um, I usually say something like this. The space inside this circle represents my realm of knowledge. Everything that I think I know about whatever I think I know is represented within the circumference of this circle. I must keep in mind that there are still things to know that exist outside the circumference of my own awareness. All right. And I got this from one of my teachers, Dr. Ray Hagens. Um, so the reason why I say this is because oftentimes when people hear something that contradicts what they've been taught, what they believe or what they think they know, they automatically reject it without doing any research to determine the validity of the new information that they're learning. And at the same time, they usually don't use that same level of scrutiny to analyze, critique or reevaluate what it is they believe or what they think they know. So just because you know everything that you know about whatever uh, this just because you know everything that you know about whatever you think you know does not mean you know th everything there is to know about whatever you think you know okay there's still things that exist outside the circumference of your own awareness and when we study this history what we're going to see is how these events are related 
historical events don't happen in the vacuum. They are the culmination of a sequence of historical events. So we'll start in 1865. OK, and, and in the class, we're going to uh, start basically January 1865. And we'll do a little recap to see how we got to the Civil War. Civil War starting April 12, 1861, with the attack on Fort Sumter in South Carolina. But we look at the Reconstruction era and we'll go look in January 1865 with special field order number 15 and 40 acres and a mule. But for a 14 year period, the U.S. government took steps to try and integrate the nation's newly freed African-American population into society. Between 1863 and 1877, the U.S. government undertook the task of integrating nearly 4 million formerly enslaved people into society after the Civil War bitterly divided the country over the issue of slavery. A white slave holding South that had built its economy and culture on slave labor was now forced by its defeat in a war that claimed 620,000 lives to change its economic, political, and social relations with African Americans. Okay. So we're dealing with the Reconstruction era. And then we're also going to talk about the Compromise of 1877 that ended Reconstruction, which was an agreement between Republicans and Democrats to uh, for uh, to allow Rutherford B. Hayes to become uh, the Republican candidate for president, to allow him to become president, Rutherford B. Hayes. And in exchange, um, he would remove the remaining Union troops out of the South, which were to a certain extent protecting the rights of African-Americans. And this allowed the uh, white supremacists, allowed the Democrats to take full control back of these southern states, these former Confederate states. This and this ends Reconstruction and, and ushers in the period of Jim Crow, the Jim Crow era. And then we're going to see that uh, the Jim Crow law cemented with the uh, 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson U.S. Supreme Court case. But this was Republicans and Democrats conspiring against African-Americans. Now, uh, historian Eric Foner, author of the book Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, 1863 to 1877, said, quote, the war, the Civil War, destroyed the institution of slavery, ensured the survival of the Union and set in motion economic and political changes that laid the foundation for the modern nation. Now, during Reconstruction, the United States made its first attempt to build an ega uh, egalitarian society on the ashes of slavery. So we'll look at 40 acres and a mule, uh, special field order number 15, issued uh, January 16th, 1865. And this, contrary to popular belief, this did not apply to all former slaves. Okay, and this is before the Civil War ends, a few months before the Civil War ends. This did not apply to all former slaves. It did not apply to all the land in the South. This is applied to coastal land in South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Coastal coastal land in South Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. Now the phrase 40 acres and a mule evokes the federal government's failure to redistribute land after the Civil War and the economic hardship that African-Americans suffered as a result. As Northern, uh, as Northern armies moved through the South at the end of the Civil War, uh, African-Americans began cultivating land abandoned by whites. Rumors developed that land would be seized from Confederates and given or sold to freedmen. OK, the former slaves freedmen. OK, you hear them referred to as freedmen or the black freedmen. You have the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, you have the, um, uh, the uh, you refer to them as black freedmen's, the Freedmen's Bank, things like this. OK, you have the. uh um, uh, uh the uh, Black Indian Freedmen, the Black Indian Treaties of 1866. We're going to see after this as well. We'll talk about that um, in the class, and you'll see the, the Black Freedmen referred to as um, uh, members of these Native American nations. Many of them were former slaves of these Native American nations, the Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians. Okay. All right. Now, um, rumors develop that land would be seized from Confederates and given or sold to freedmen. These rumors rested on solid foundations 
abolitionists uh, on Sound of Foundations, abolitionists had discussed land redistribution at the beginning of the Civil War. And in 1863, President Abraham Lincoln ordered 20,000 acres of land confiscated in South Carolina, sold to freedmen in 20 acre plots. Secretary of, uh, of the Treasury, Salmon Chase, expanded the offering to 40 acres per family. Now, once again, this is not going to it, it's it's going to be end up being uh, 400,000 acres of land. 400,000 acres of land that go to about 40,000 African-American families. OK, it doesn't go to um, all the former slaves. It's about three point nine million free uh, enslaved African people. It doesn't go to all of them. And what's going to happen is um, majority of this land is going to be taken back by President Andrew Johnson, who succeeds Lincoln when Lincoln is assassinated, uh, when he's uh, shot April 14th, 1865 at the Ford Theater. Now, on uh, when we look at uh, Gen General William T. Sherman, who issued Special Field Order Number 15, um, it really this special field order redistributed roughly 400,000 confiscated acres of land in low country and and uh, South Carolina in low country, Georgia, South Carolina, but also Florida. It's going to be Georgia, South Carolina and Florida. OK, and it's going to be um, Georgia, South Carolina and Florida, and it's going to be coastal land. Now, when the Freedmen's Bureau was established in March of 1865. Um, it created partly it was created partly to redistribute confiscated land from Southern whites. It gave legal title for 40 acre plots to African-Americans and white Southern unionists. All right. But what's going to happen is President Andrew Johnson, who succeeds Lincoln after Lincoln's assassinated and Andrew Johnson was sympathetic to the Confederacy and sympathetic to the Southern plantation owners. He's going to take the majority of that land back after the war was over in 1865, April of 1865, the Civil War ends. Uh, President Andrew Johnson returned most of the land to the former white slave owners. At its peak during Reconstruction, the Freedmen's Bureau had 900 agents scattered across 11 southern states, handling everything from labor disputes to distributing clothing and food to uh, starting schools to protecting freedmen's uh, freedmen from the Ku Klux Klan. So the Ku Klux Klan is founded December 24th, 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee, about a week or so after the 13th Amendment is uh, adopted. It's adopted December 18th, 1865. And we're going to um, see the Klan as, that was founded as a fraternal organization. We're going to see the Klan grow in strength and uh, they're going to attack African-Americans. They're going to lynch African-Americans, but they're not just attacking African-Americans. They're also attacking um, white Republicans. They were attacking white Republicans as well and lynching some of them also. Even though the majority of the people who are going to be the victims of lynching are African-Americans, specifically African-American men. We know also from... Uh, 1882 to 1968 is about 4,743 people lynched in this country. 72% are African American. Um, at uh, NAACP.org, uh, they have a section dealing with lynchings and they deal with a whole history of lynchings. And they talk about from 1882 to 1968, 4,743 people were lynched. Uh, Mississippi had was the state with the most number of lynchings that about 581 lynchings. But also during that period of time, there were 1,297 white people lynched as well because uh, the Klan and other domestic terrorist organizations are also attacking white Republicans uh, uh, also and lynching them as well. OK, let's continue here. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcasting on social media platforms. We invite your friends to tune in. So we're doing an overview of a new 10 week online course that uh, I teach. This is going to be on Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, this is uh, from the Civil War to Civil Rights and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. 
uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can uh, register for the 10 week online course there. OK, each class will uh, break down an, an approximately 10 year period of time to get a better understanding of this history, starting in 1865, the year the Civil War ended and the 13th Amendment was ratified to get a better understanding of this history, how all these historical events are connected, understanding politics and how laws and policies shape conditions and understand how we got to where we are today so we know where to go from here. Um, on the homepage of our website, when you scroll down, you'll see the information for the online course. Uh, click right here to register here and it'll take you to the next page. Uh, on the next page, uh, just click on enroll. OK, click on enroll. Class is regularly one hundred thirty dollars is on sale. Eighty dollars. Click right here to enroll. As soon as you register, there's bonus content that you can start watching and uh, you'll be uh, ready for class on Saturday, uh, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, all the sessions are recorded. All the sessions are recorded. So you can go back and watch it over and over again, and you don't have to worry about missing class. Um, we record the classes live. You can go back and watch those also. You'll still have access to the uh, online course even after the 10 week course is over with. So next year, you can still go back and watch the same course content. You'll still have access to it. I'm going to post the link to the online course there. You can register for it. As soon as you register, you can start watching content. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in as well. And you can ask questions in class also. We have a, a live text chat. Okay. So you can see me. I can't see you. You can ask questions in class uh, also. So during this reconstruction period, we have the uh, three reconstruction uh, constitutional amendments, 13th Amendment uh, that uh, uh, ends chattel slavery, uh, 14th Amendment of 1868 that gives uh, citizenship to the uh, formerly enslaved African-Americans, um, 14th Amendment, then the 15th Amendment, which guarantees the uh, right to vote for African-American men doesn't apply to African-American women in 1870, but uh, is uh, ratified uh, uh, February 3rd, 1870, the 15th Amendment. Now, as written, the 15th Amendment does not explicitly grant anyone the right to vote. And nowhere in the U.S. Constitution, nowhere in the U.S. Constitution does it explicitly uh, give anyone the right to vote. The 15th Amendment protects the right to vote, okay? The 19th Amendment, um, uh, that uh, the 19th Amendment um, guarantees the right to vote to women. OK, 19th Amendment of 1920. OK, and then also you're going to have um, later in 1971. OK, later in 1971, the uh, 26th Amendment uh, to the U.S. Constitution is going to um, uh, July 1st, 1971. Uh, the 16th, uh, the 26th Amendment is going to lower the uh, voting age, minimum voting age from 21 down to 18. OK, that's the 26th Amendment, 1971 under uh, Richard Nixon. All right. So um, the 15th Amendment prohibits federal and state governments from placing restrictions on voting based on three criteria, race, color and previous condition of servitude. OK, enslavement. Uh, the entire amendment is two sentences long. Section one of the 15th Amendment says the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color or previous condition of servitude. Uh, section two says the Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. The Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation and uh, read this article here from um, from the Smithsonian Institute American history .si .edu. does an amendment give you the right to vote does an amendment give you the right to vote this is from uh, February 3rd 2020 and it talks about how nowhere in the US Constitution does it explicitly give anyone the right to vote so you have the 15th amendment that guarantees the right to vote and then you have the 19th Amendment that guarantees the right to vote to women and the 26th Amendment. But the 19th Amendment, the 26th Amendment, that language is based upon the 15th Amendment. OK. All right. Take a look at this here. 
take a look at this here and we'll be back in just a minute. All right, let's continue here. Okay, so we have the um, 15th Amendment of 1870 uh, to the U.S. Constitution that uh, guaranteed the right to vote. Uh, 15th Amendment of 1870 guaranteed that the right to vote could not be denied based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The amendment complemented and followed in the wake of the passage of the 13th Amendment and 14th Amendments, which abolished slavery and guaranteed citizenship respectively to African-Americans. The passage of the 15th Amendment and its subsequent ratification February 3rd, 1870, effective, effectively enfranchised African-American men while denying the right to vote to women of all colors. Women would not receive that right until the ratification of the 19th Amendment of 1920. All right. So this is still during the reconstruction era. And what we're going to do, this is just a preview of the uh, 10 week online course. But what we'll do is each class will go through and analyze a 10 year period of history. We're going to go through this chronologically, analyze a 10 year period of history so we can really, really dig in and see what happened, see how these historical events are connected, see the laws and policies put in place to put us in the predicament that we are today. OK, so once we understand how we got here, we have a better understanding of what we need to do, what the next steps are. And we can see politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power and resources and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments and treaties, their adoption, interpretation and enforcement. And all the fights that are taking place today over critical race theory and uh, so, uh, suppressing the what can be taught in schools uh, as far as the history of slavery and uh, systemic racism and all this stuff. A lot of this has to do with not understanding history and people wanting to keep certain people from understanding history also. All right, uh, let's continue here. Uh, let me see here. Okay. So let's continue. Now, after the Civil War, during the period known as Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877, and we'll do a Reconstruction in class number one, the amendment was successful. 15th Amendment was successful in encouraging African-Americans to vote. Many African-Americans were even elected to public office during the 1880s in the uh, states that uh, formerly had constituted the Confederate States of America. OK, and even in the 1870s, because uh, Hiram Rhodes Revel uh, uh, becomes uh, first U.S. senator and only U.S. senator in Mississippi in, 18, in uh, 1870. OK, now the uh, by the 1890s, uh, however, efforts by several states to enact such such measures as poll taxes, literacy tests and grandfather clauses, in addition to widespread threats and violence had completely reversed those trends. So we so we're going to see a, a total attack on the rights of African Americans especially after reconstruction ends in 1877. Okay? We're going to see these southern states uh work to just take back all take back the advances and gains that we made. During reconstruction, you're going to have about 2,000 African American men elected to public office in South Carolina. 
in South Carolina during Reconstruction, the majority of the state legislature in South Carolina was African American, African American men, the majority of them. Okay, um, and we know in Mississippi, the majority of the population in Mississippi during the Reconstruction era in the eighteen eighty and early eighteen nineties, the majority of the population in Mississippi were African Americans. This is a legacy of slavery. It, when we when we look at the um, Great Migration, okay, and we look at even though the Great Migration starts in nineteen fifteen about 1915, if we look at 1910 and we look at 1900, 90% of African-Americans lived in the South. 90% of African-Americans lived in the South in 1900. It wasn't because we love the heat. That's a legacy of slavery. You're talking about 1900, you're talking about 35 years after chattel slavery ends in the end of the Civil War. Okay, so by the 1890s, however, efforts by several states to enact uh, such measures as poll taxes, literacy tests, and grandfather clauses, in addition to widespread threats and violence, had completely reversed those trends. By the beginning of the 20th century, nearly all African Americans in the states of the former Confederacy were again disenfranchised. So if we look at this here, uh, we, we look at the Mississippi State Constitution of um, 1890. Mississippi State Constitution of 1890 in the Mississippi uh, State Convention. There's an article. If you watch my show, you see me refer to this article before. There's an article from Washington Post. Called the Mississippi plan to keep blacks from voting in 1890. We came here to exclude the Negro. The Mississippi plan to keep blacks from voting in 1890. We came here to exclude the Negro. And this deals with. Um, the effort in Mississippi to suppress the African American vote. Now, this article is from Mar uh, from May first, twenty twenty one. May first, twenty twenty one, and at this Mississippi State Convention, when they're going to vote on the Mississippi State Constitution, the convention uh, was presided over by a white county judge named Solomon Saladin Calhoun. Solomon Saladin Calhoun. And he he put the voting issue bluntly. He said, let's tell the truth if it burst the bottom of the universe. Let's tell the truth if it burst the bottom of the universe. He said, we came here to exclude the Negro. Nothing short of this will answer. We came here to exclude the Negro. Nothing short of this will answer. They're trying to disenfranchise 1890 in Mississippi. They want to disenfranchise African-Americans from being able to vote because we were voting African-Americans into office. They're trying to lock us back into uh, a subservient position. And in one of the things that these Southerners resented is that now you have former slaves being elected to uh, office and they're making decisions that impact everybody. And they're trying to lock us back into a subservient position. It's also going to be during this period of time that you're going to see uh, the majority of the Confederate monuments built as well. OK, well, um, I'll show you. Um, I'll show you uh, a graph that uh, deals with that, because I've done an entire lecture dealing with the history of um, the Confederate monuments also. All right. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcasting and social media platforms. How y'all like this type of information? Uh, this is a preview once again of a of a new 10 week online course that uh, I'm teaching on Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time called from the Civil War to the Civil Right to Civil Rights and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Each class will go through and analyze a 10 year period of time in history. We're going to go through chronologically and see what happened after slavery ended, how we were accumulating land, how we were building communities. We're going to have the uh, Reconstruction in 1877. We're going to have the Jim Crow era uh, instituted. We have a reversal of these rights. We have land stolen. We have uh, domestic terrorism taking place. Uh, and then we're going to uh, deal with uh, the Mississippi State Convention of 1890 and the 
the Mississippi State Constitution in 1890, the Louisiana State Constitution in 1898, Grandfather Clause 1898, Plessy versus Ferguson 1896, uh, U.S. Supreme Court case. Uh, we'll look at things like the uh, Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, uh, and this, we're going to the 1900s. We're, one of the things that causes African Americans to leave the South is not just the Great Migration. It's not just World War One. It's also the Bow Weevil attack in the late 1800s, late 1890s, early 1900s, and the Bow Weevil migrating from Central uh, America, like Mexico, into the southern states and it's attacking cotton crops and destroying cotton crops, which forces many African Americans to leave the South and go up North looking for better opportunities as well. Okay. So we're going to deal with this chronology of history. All right, let's continue here. So this is just a brief overview of the 10 week online course. And I do a PowerPoint presentation in the course. We have video clips, book references, articles, uh, all types of things like this. All right. So poll uh, um, we were talking about the uh, Mississippi State Constitution in, uh, of 1890. And what's going to happen is that we're going to see other uh, states start adopting what Mississippi puts in place. Now, delegates eventually. Uh, delegates eventually adopted a literacy test and poll tax geared to suppress the African-American vote in the state with a black majority, Mississippi, Maj uh, Mississippi, the majority of the population of Mississippi was African-American. They're going to vote at this state convention to institute poll taxes and literacy tests in an effort to disenfranchise African-Americans. It was called the Mississippi plan, the Mississippi plan. And this plan became the model throughout the South part of a raft of racially oppressive Jim Crow laws that ended reconstruction. Okay. All right. Now you have, uh, Texas. Okay. Uh, now, now, uh, Mrs. Uh, in 1876, we're going to see, uh, something similar in the uh, Texas state constitution that leads to all white primaries, like the all white, all white primaries in 1918. Now, Mississippi's 1890 con uh, convention sought to find a way around the 15th amendment to the U S constitution which uh, guaranteed the right to vote for African-American men. Just two decades earlier, Mississippi uh, state legislature had made history by electing Hiram Rhodes Revels to the U.S. Senate. He was the uh, first African-American member to serve in either house, uh, either house of Congress. But that moment of racial progress quickly vanished. OK, this is a picture of Hiram Rhodes Revels. Was the only uh, African American U.S. Senator from Mississippi, the only one, Hiram Rose Rebels. Um, after Rutherford B. Hayes removed all federal troops from the South, uh, states in eighteen uh, Southern states in eighteen seventy seven, white Democrats who who uh, has supported slavery and the Confederacy began regaining control of the states from Black and white Republicans regaining control of the states from black and white Republicans. Okay. And you're going to have Isaiah T. Montgomery, who was the president of Bay I'm sorry, he was the mayor of Bayou, Mississippi and the founder of Bayou, Mississippi, Isaiah T. Montgomery. He was the only African-American who um, was uh, at the Mississippi state uh, convention. And he votes along, he votes to disenfranchise African-Americans. OK, Isaiah T. Montgomery, he was an American man. He was the mayor of Bayou, Mississippi and the founder of Bayou, Mississippi. His opinion, Isaiah T. Montgomery. I think he's related to Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina. OK, uh, Black Tea Party Republican Senator Tim Scott. I think he's I think he's related to uh, him one way or another. I think Senator Tim Scott and Isaiah T. Montgomery are, are related. OK, but read this um, article here from the Washington Post, the Mississippi plan to keep blacks from voting in 1890. We came here to exclude the Negro. And what's going to, what's going to happen is that uh, other Southern states are going to adopt um, poll taxes and literacy tests, things like this obstacles to the 15th amendment. And they're going to put those in, they're going to uh, adopt, those, adopt those in their state constitutions also. All right, let's continue.
So poll taxes in federal elections were uh, abolished by the 24th Amendment of 1964, the 24th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution of 1964. And in 1966, the U.S. Supreme Court, um, 1966, the U.S. Supreme Court extended the ban to state and local elections. Now, the Voting Rights Act of uh, 1965, August 1965, abolished prerequis prerequisites to registration and voting and also allow for federal preclearance of changes in election laws in certain covered jurisdictions, including uh, nine mostly Southern states, all right? In Shelby County versus Holder, U.S. Supreme Court case of um, uh, 2013, which got section five of the Voting Rights Act, okay? The Supreme Court struck down the section of the Voting Rights Act that have been used to identify uh, covered jurisdictions, effectively making the preclearance requirement unforceable, unenforceable. So what the preclearance stated uh, uh, in the um, 1965 Voting Rights Act is that uh, states and districts that had a history of putting obstacles in the way of African-Americans voting, like the poll taxes and literacy tests and things like this and had intimidation, uh, et cetera, if they want to make any changes to polling locations, polling locations, the hours that polls are open, uh, how many weekends you can have souls to the poll voting, how many days you can have early voting. If they want to make any changes, they had to get approval from a federal judge. This is the preclearance. OK, and that protected a lot of the rights of African-Americans when that was struck down in 2013. U.S. Supreme Court case Shelby County versus Holder. Uh, within 24 hours, you had uh, states starting to pass new voter ID laws, because as soon as the 15th, as soon as the Voting Rights Act went into place, you had people trying to figure out ways around it to uh, put obstacles in the way of us voting once again. So the because of Shelby County versus Holder, the 2016 presidential election, there were eight hundred. 868 fewer polling places, 868 fewer polling places in the 2016 presidential election. There was a, and this is directly tied to the Voting Rights Act being weakened by the Shelby County versus Holder U.S. Supreme Court case. See, a lot of people don't understand how all of this is connected. Um, there was an article from November 4, 2016, okay, four days before the presidential election, uh, 2016. There's an article from uh, the nation.com by Ari Berman. Name of this article, there are 868 fewer places to vote in 2016 because the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act. And he goes through and shows how all this is, how all this uh, is related. Okay. So you have, um, check out this article. Now, today, uh, nearly half of counties that previously approved voting changes with the federal government have cut polling places this election. And then that negatively impacted the 2016 presidential election because you had 868 fewer polling places. A lot of those polling places were shut down in African-American communities, which causes longer lines and different things like this. So you have that piece. Now, uh, today, there are approximately 1,600, 1,700 uh, fewer polling places. There was a um, article from uh, Mother Jones. Uh, it's a good piece from, uh, who is that? I think that's uh, from Mother Jones. Uh, 16, about 1,600 fewer polling places, probably now 1,700. Uh, this piece here from September 10th, 2019. September 10th, 2019. Uh, more than 1,600 polling places have closed since the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now, so we, we're seeing a direct correlation between 1965, which is part of the Civil Rights Movement, and one of the crowning achievements of, of the Civil Rights Movement, the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and then the attack on it by Republicans 
with the Supreme Court case of Shelby County versus Holder 2013, which was a direct backlash also to President President Barack Obama being reelected in, in 2012. And in 2012, the percentage of African-Americans registered to vote who actually voted was was at a was a record. Sixty six point six percent, sixty point six percent, sixty six point six percent of African-Americans registered to vote actually voted in the 2012 presidential election. And that was the first presidential election where the percentage of African-Americans who voted was higher than the percentage of white people who voted. This scared the hell out of a, a lot of Republicans. So they come back the next year with Supreme with uh, with the Shelby County versus Holder uh, challenge goes to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court guts Section five of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, more than sixteen hundred polling places have been closed since the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act. Now, the now the the the, the voter suppression bills that are passing that pass uh, like in Georgia, SB 202 and what they're trying to push through uh, the Texas state legislature. And uh, what they're trying to push through other state legislatures, if the Voting Rights Act was fully intact, if Section 5 had not been gutted, those bills would not be able to pass through the state legislature because they would have to get uh, approval from a federal judge to be able to make the changes that they're trying to make. The reason why the Voting Rights Act of 65 was needed is because of what happened with the compromise of 1877, what happened with Mississippi in 1890, and these uh, poll taxes and literacy tests that are being put in place in states in the late 1890s. What happened in 1890 and 1898 is directly impacting what's taking place right, here, right now in 2021. So we have to understand how all of this is connected and all these laws and policies are impacting us so we understand how to fight against them. OK. Um, all right. So everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Be sure to follow us here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network, and also my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. OK. Um, Britannica.com has some good basic information on the 15th Amendment. Check that out. Britannica.com, the 15th Amendment. Let's continue here. Now, this is all during the Reconstruction era. Now, this is just a preview. This is just a preview of what we're going to cover in the online course. This is going to be 10 consecutive Saturdays. Each Saturday, we're going to go through and break down. It's about a two hour class. We're going to go through and break down a 10 year period of history. OK, uh, who still needs to register for the online course? I'm going to post a link here so you can register for it. as soon as you register this uh, bonus content as you can start watching also. All right. Now, when we deal with the force acts, the four force acts during Reconstruction, force acts in U.S. history. These were a series of four acts passed by Republican Reconstruction uh, supporters in the Congress between May 31st, 1870 and May 1st, 1875 to protect the constitutional rights guaranteed to African-Americans by the 14th and 15th Amendments. The major provisions of the acts authorized federal authorities to enforce penalties upon anyone interfering with the registration, voting, office holding, or jury service of African Americans. Okay, this is uh, these are the force acts in uh, during Reconstruction from 1870 to 1875. You're going to have these four acts that are going to pass uh, pass Congress and be uh, signed into law. Um, these acts empowered the president to use military force to make summary arrests under the act of April 20th, 1871, also known as the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. Nine South Carolina counties were placed under martial law by President Ulysses S. Grant in October of 1871, October of 1871. Because, see, the, the Klan was killing and terrorizing African-Americans so much. They were uh, attacking um, uh, African-Americans in elected office, things like this. So President Ulysses S. Grant declared martial law in nine South Carolina counties under the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. This act and earlier statutes 
resulted in more than 5,000 indictments and 1,200, uh, 1,250 uh, 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 convictions throughout the South. In subsequent uh, Supreme Court decisions, various sections of the acts were declared unconstitutional. So that's in 1883, U.S. Supreme Court strikes down um, some portions of the 1871 Ku Klux Klan Act, but it's still in effect today. It's still on the books today. Uh, read this piece here from uh, Britannica.com, Force Acts, Force Acts. And this deals with the Reconstruction Era uh, as well. Okay, now the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, uh, ratified in 1868, defines citizenship. I'm sorry, the 14th Amendment of uh, 18, uh, ratified in 1868, defines citizenship and guaranteed uh, due process and equal protection of the law to all. Vigilante groups like the Ku Klux Klan, however, freely threatened African Americans and their white allies in the South and undermine the Republican Party's plan for reconstruction. The bill authorized the president to intervene in the former rebel states that attempted to deny any person or any class of persons of the equal protection of the laws or of equal privileges or immunities under the laws. To act uh, uh, to take action against this newly defined federal crime, the president could suspend habeas corpus, deploy the U.S. military or use, quote, other means as he may deem necessary, end quote. Uh, now, this uh, this information, this comes from history.house.gov, history.house.gov. Now, house.gov is the official website of the U.S. House of Representatives and house.gov and Senate.gov official website of the U.S. Senate, they have a history section there as well. This is from history.house.gov, the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. OK, so this is just a brief overview of the content that we're going to deal with in the online course. And we're going to go through our history decade by decade to see what happened, why it happened, how we got here and how all this affects us today. 1890, the Mississippi State Convention. We came here to exclude the Negro. We just talked about this, the article from the Washington Post. Um, they instituted literacy tests and poll taxes, things like this, to disenfranchise African-Americans. Uh, now, James Vard Vardaman uh, in 1890 uh, served in the Mississippi uh, State Legislature. He said, quote, there is no use to equivocate or lie about the matter. Um, in, in he was uh, in the Mississippi State Legislature at the time of, of the Mississippi State Convention and later became governor of the state of Mississippi. He said in Mississippi, we have in our Constitution legislated against the racial peculi peculiarities of the Negro. When that device fails, we will resort to something else, end quote. Now, the impact of the legislation was swift of um the Mississippi's uh, state constitution of 1890. The impact of the le legislation was swift. By 1910, registered voters among African-Americans dropped to 15% in Virginia and under 2% in both Alabama and Mississippi. According to historian Donald J. Uh, Nyman in his book, Promises to Keep African-Americans and the Constitutional Order, 1776 to the Present. Read this article here from history.com. History.com is official website of the History Channel. How Jim Crow era laws suppress the African-American vote for generations. How Jim Crow era laws suppressed the African-American vote for generations. OK, and, and and what we are seeing today that's taking place in 48 state legislatures, 389 voter restriction bills based upon a big lie based upon a big lie that the election was stolen from Donald Trump. No, it wasn't. He lost based upon a big lie. We see the same thing that took place in, in, in Mississippi in 1890. We see them implementing these obstacles to African-Americans and Latinos and Asian-Americans and, and college students and, and elderly uh, white people who vote through uh, mail-in ballots. We see them putting these obstacles in place to maintain power so they, so Republicans can win more elections with a declining population, with a declining population. Now, 
these restrictions are also going to lead to all white primaries. And we're going to see all white primaries like in Texas. OK, in the, in the Texas state constitution, they had a phrase called purity of the ballot box, purity of the ballot box. Um, and this came uh, this was brought to light uh, a couple months ago uh, because of the debate that took place in the uh, Texas uh, uh, state house. Uh, let me see here. We got that. All right. But what are all right primaries when literacy tests, poll taxes and grandfather clauses and the many other ways to circumvent the 15th Amendment did not work to suppress African-American voter turnout. White legislators in several southern states used all white primaries to all but eliminate African-American voters presence in the electoral process. After a white election official blocked an African-American man named Lonnie E. Smith, the right to vote in the 1940 Texas Democratic primary, the NAACP's uh, Thurgood Marshall and William H. Uh, Hasty, H-A-S-T-I-E, challenged the case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. In 1944, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in uh, the case Smith versus Allwright that the Texas white primary system was unconstitutional, that the Texas white uh, uh, primary system was unconstitutional. This goes back to the Texas um, state constitution of 1876. And there was a, uh, there was an article here from Washington Post the reference that deals with the uh, purity of the ballot box. I'm trying to find that article here from the Washington Post. Uh, we'll try to pull that up so you can see that. Because all, all of this history is connected. And when we study this, we get to see how Historical events don't happen in a vacuum. They are the culmination of a sequence of historical events that lead to larger events taking place. You know, I've, I've been talking about how uh, Haiti, Jamaica and Cuba are all in the news. And these are all uh, countries. These are all islands that Christopher Columbus conquered in 1492 and 1494 on behalf of the Spanish crown. We're still feeling the effects of that Spanish conquest and then later the, the British taking over uh, Jamaica and the French taking over Haiti, St. Dominique, Haiti, which is the western portion of the island that Hispaniola was on. Uh, uh, the, the and uh, St. Dominique becoming Haiti. We're still feeling the effects of what happened a little over 500 years ago. Uh, let me pull up this article here. Washington Post. Okay, just a second. How's everybody doing? How y'all like this type of information? Now, if you've taken my uh, other online course, uh, the, uh, the other 10 week online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school, this new class picks up where the old one leaves off, okay, in general. Uh, read this article here from the Washington Post. A Texas bill drew ire for saying it would preserve purity of the ballot box. OK. For saying it would preserve uh, purity of the ballot box. Here's the phrase's history. OK. A Texas bill drew ire for saying it would, would it would preserve purity of the ballot box. Here's the phrase's history. OK. Now, this article is let's see here this article is from um may 9th 2021 so this article is not from you know 1921 this is from may 9th 2021 this this is how and, and the debate took place in the texas state house okay 
This is how recent this stuff is. And we're still feeling the effects of what took place. 1876. And when you when you study the history of Texas and, and um, Texas comes into the Union in 1845 as a slaveholding state and after winning its independence from Mexico in 1836. And then 1846, the following year after 1845, 1846, you have the Mexican-American War of 1846 to 1848. And then the U.S. is going to get. Um, uh, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Utah, and Nevada because of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848, which ends the Mexican-American War. The U.S. is going to get all that land uh, for uh, about $15 million. Uh, Mexico loses uh, one third of their land uh, because of, uh, of that treaty. But the U.S. wants to basically take over the entire North American continent. So you're going to see this land expansion. This is after the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, which doubles the territory of the U.S. And uh, they got the and they bought the land from uh, from France for uh, 15 million dollars. They bought the land from France. But France stole the land from Native Americans and Africans who were here. France had no authority to sell that land. France sold 828,000 square miles of land for less than three cents an acre. France had no authority to sell that land. They stole the land. So you have one thief buying the land from another thief. So in Texas, for example, the, the 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 state legislature gave the Democratic Party the authority to set its own rules. The party determined that it was for white voters only, excluding African-Americans from its elections and effectively making local electoral policies dominated by one party that upheld Jim, Jim Crow laws. OK, see, this is dealing with the all white primaries that Texas was having. All right. So this is just a sample of the type of information that we're going to deal with. We're going to take you through our history so we can better understand this. And each class will go through and analyze a 10 year, approximately 10 year period of time. We'll go through decade by decade. OK, I'm going to post a link here. You can register for this new 10 week online course. We have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to uh, 1968. And uh, this is going to be Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. OK, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. First class is um, Saturday, July 24th, 2021. If you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, scroll down the page, you'll see the information for the online course. Below it, you'll see the information for uh, the other 10 uh, week online course that I teach where we deal with thousands of years of history, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And we deal with thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. And we deal with ancient Africa, ancient Kemet, Nubia, Ethiopia, um, Ghana, Songhai, Mali. We deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors and uh, the African presence in uh the land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago and in South America going back at least 56,000 years ago. And one of the um, uh, books that uh, I reference is uh, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence uh, by my friend, Dr. David M. Hotep, who actually spoke to our class. Um, so uh, June 12th, uh, when I taught this class previously, early in the year, June 12th, uh, he spoke to uh, spoke to my class and we have that archived also. So when you register for uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understand the transatlantic slave trade, you'll get that uh, archived content also. OK. All right. So you can. Um, Register for both online courses if you like at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. But when you click on register here, it takes you to uh, the next page. And uh, this is uh, from the Civil War to Civil Rights and Black Power. Click on enroll. And as soon as you uh, register, you can start watching the bonus content and you can join us in class on Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The uh, classes regularly 
uh, $130 is on sale, $80. And like I said, all the content is archived as well. We do the class live, but the content is archived. So if you miss any of the class or anything, you can go back and watch it over and over again. And you still have access to the content even after the course is over with. All right. So we have, um, um, so we have this in Texas here and we're going to see similar things in other former Confederate states. Now, when we look at the great migration, we'll talk about world war one, 1914 to 1918. We'll deal with Henry Ford, 1908 in Highland park, Michigan, but the great migration is going to change this country. Great migration is going to change this country directly related to slavery and, and Jim Crow and the domestic terrorism that's taking place, but also the bow weevil attack of the late uh, 1890s and the early 1900s on uh, on uh, uh, cotton crops. But uh, the Great Migration was the relocation of more than six million African-Americans from the rural south to the cities of the north, Midwest and West from about 1916 to 1970, 1915, 1916, 1970. Okay, the Great Migration. And the Great Migration is going to uh, change uh, the history of this country also. Now, at this time, not about 90% of African-Americans lived in the South. Okay, it's important to know that, once again, as a legacy of slavery. Now, I want to... Um, before I forget, I want to look at this uh, piece here from. Uh, I want to look at this piece dealing with the uh, lynchings. OK. And this deals with the uh, Confederate monuments, I should say, the Confederate monuments, the real story behind the Confederate monuments. So you have these debates taking place over Confederate monuments. Should they should they stay? Uh, they're part of our heritage, things like this, where they're, they're honoring traitors to the Union. Number one, we just saw the statues of General Robert E. Lee and Thomas Stonewall Jackson removed from um, Charlottesville, Virginia, from the park there in Charlottesville, Virginia, where the Unite the Right rally took place in August 2017. And what a lot of people don't know is that these Confederate monuments were not built right after slavery ended. They're built during two main periods of time in history. OK, and this this chart here, uh, the real story behind all those Confederate monuments from motherjones.com. This chart here uh, lays out this history and what happened. So you have two main periods of time that these Confederate monuments are built, basically about 1895 to about 1915. Uh, and then from about 1955, 1954, 1955 to 1970. So you're looking at the civil rights movement. So you're looking at uh, Jim Crow era. OK. And if, if we look at this chart here, uh, this graph uh, from about 1885, they show about 1885 to about 1895, right in that period of time. Blacks lose vote. Jim Crow laws enacted. OK. This is during that period of time that we're talking about after Reconstruction. Then we look at 1900 to 1915. Lynchings, lost cause, lost cause myth, KKK monument building. And um, I said uh, lost cause myth, KKK monument building. So we're going to see that from 1900 to 1915, we're going to see... Uh, uh, this lost cause uh, myth being pushed that the Civil War, uh, that, that the Confederacy fought the Civil War for states' rights, wasn't about slavery, things like this, this whole lost cause myth. We're going to see a rise in the Ku Klux Klan in 1915. And it's going to continue in the 1920s, rise in the Ku Klux Klan because of the movie The Birth of a Nation, okay? That rejuvenates the Ku Klux Klan, comes out in 1915. And then during the Civil Rights era, uh, about 1955 or so to 1970, that's going to be the second largest period of time that Confederate monuments are being built and they're being built in opposition to the civil rights movement. All right. So the, the, these Confederate monuments and statues, most of this wasn't built 
right after the Civil War ended, anything like this. They they were built to terrorize African Americans and to lock us into a low position in society and remind us of of the low position in society that we are supposed to have that 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 white supremacists think we are supposed to have. Um, this graph illustrates something that even a lot of liberals don't always get. Most of the uh, monuments were erected right after the, uh, most of the monuments were not erected right after the Civil War. In fact, all the way to 1890, there were very few statues or monuments dedicated to Confederate leaders. Most of them were built much later. And uh, OK, so then they go through and they have a little brief timeline of history as well. Um, uh, Civil War. Reconstruction, uh, Reconstruction era ends, lynching skyrocket 1875 and 1895. African Americans are steadily disenfranchised. All Southern, uh, white, uh, all Southern whites to enact, uh, Jim Crow laws in 1896. Jim Crow is cemented into place when the Supreme Court rules the constitutional. That's, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, 1895 to 1915. With African Americans disenfranchised and Jim Crow law safely in place, Southern whites continue their campaign of terror against African Americans. This era features continued lynchings, the growing popularity of lost cause revisionist histories, a resurgence of white supremacy organizations like the Klan, because the Klan had largely died out by 1915. You have a new resurgence of the Klan in 1915 after the movie The Birth of a Nation debuts February 8th, 1915. This movie is going to cause race riots in the streets when we really go in and talk about this movie in the in the class. And um, you're going to have uh, the Reverend William Joseph Simmons who late 1915 after seeing the movie, the birth of a nation is going to launch a reincarnation of the Ku Klux Klan. Okay. And this reincarnation is going to have both Democrats and Republicans as members of the Klan. Okay. Um, and the erection of Confederate statues and monuments in larger numbers. We're going to see this, the revisionist histories, a resurgence of white uh, supremacy organizations like the, uh, like the KKK and the erection of Fe uh, Confederate statues and monuments in large numbers. This is 1895 to 1915. 1915 to 1955, uh, the Jim Crow, uh, Jim Crow reigns safely, safely throughout the South. And because of these Jim Crow laws, because of what happens in uh, the, the, the end of Reconstruction, because of what happens in the late 1890s, this causes the need for a, a modern day civil rights movement. 1955, the civil rights era, Starts with the Supreme Court uh, uh, case of Brown versus Board of Education and Supreme Court rules that Jim Crow laws are unconstitutional. Southern whites mount massive and violent resistance and start putting up Confederate monuments again in direct opposition to the civil rights movement. They're also going to use the Confederate battle flag of Northern Virginia under General Robert E. Lee's army that most people think is the Confederate flag. They're going to use that as a symbol of opposition to the civil rights movement as well. And they're going to start naming a lot of schools after Confederate heroes as an opposition to the civil rights movement also. OK, so all this is taking place during that period of time. And a lot of those monuments are still up today. A lot of those schools are still named after Confederate uh, traitors. They committed treason based upon Article 3, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution. So if we look quickly here at uh, the Great Migration. Um, the Great Migration was the relocation of more than six million African Americans from the rural South to the cities of uh, North, uh, Midwest, and West from about 1960 to 1970, driven from their homes by unsatisfactory economic uh, opportunities and harsh segregationist laws. Many African Americans headed North, where they uh, took advantage of the need for industrial workers. Um, that first arose during the first world war, world war one during the great migration, African-Americans began to build a new place for themselves in public life, actively confronting racial prejudice as well as economic, political, and social changes to create a, uh, to create an African-American urban culture that would exert enormous influence in the decades to come. We're going to see things like the um, the Harlem Renaissance. We're going to see things like the 
Universal Negro Improvement Association, which starts in 1914 in Jamaica with Marcus Garvey. And he comes to the U.S. in 1916 and he's building chapters of the UNIA. Um, we're going to see the um, in 1915, we're going to see the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History founded. OK. Uh, and we see uh, February 8th, 1915, the birth of uh, movie, The Birth of a Nation that promotes the image of the happy slave. We're going to see. Uh, uh, that movie debut. Um, we're going to see that we fight against the people like uh, Charlotte Bass of the California Eagle, uh, a black newspaper in, in, in California, and uh, people like William Monroe Trotter in Boston. We're going to launch campaigns against the movie The Birth of a Nation. We're going to have people like um, uh, Oscar Michaud to make movies that are in opposition to the depiction of African-Americans in the in the movie, The Birth of a Nation. OK, we're going to see things like the Red Summer 1919, uh, the Red Summer 1919 uh, take place. And during the Red Summer of uh, this is William Monroe Trotter uh, during the Red Summer of 1919, you're going to have over 25 major race riots in this country. And this is the year after World War One ends. And a lot of these uh White men, when they went to fight in the war, they left jobs behind. When they came back, these jobs were being filled by African-Americans and, and immigrants who were here. And this causes racial conflicts. And you had African-American men who uh, went to the war. We learned how to fight, how to, how to kill, how to shoot, things like this. So we're bringing back those skills back to our communities. And we're using those skills to protect our communities when these, when, uh, when these uh, race riots break out. The Red Summer 1919 marked the culmination of steadily growing tensions surrounding the great migration of African-Americans from the rural South to the cities of the North that took place during World War One. When the war ended in late 1918, thousands of servicemen returned home from fighting in Europe to find that their jobs in factories, warehouses and mills uh, had been filled by newly arrived Southern African-Americans or immigrants amid financial insecurity racial and ethnic prejudices uh, ran rampant. Meanwhile, African-American veterans who had risked their lives fighting for the cause of freedom and democracy found themselves denied basic rights such as adequate housing and equality under the law, leading, uh, leading them to become increasingly militant. So when these brothers come back home, they, they had a new concept. They were called the new Negro. The new Negro. Now, at the same time, you have the formation of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Found in September 9th, 1915, by um, uh, a co-founder co by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. OK, you had a big race ride in in Chicago in 1919. We have the Harlem Renaissance, 1910s, 1930s. OK, but you're going to have uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson who co-founded the Association for the, for the Study of Negro Life and History, September 9th, 1915. And all this is taking place. All this is coinciding. The, the new Negro, and they're called race men who have pride in their race. And when these brothers come back home from World War I, they say, we want all of our rights now. We want first-class citizenship now. OK, not 100 years from now, they say we fought for this country. We shed blood for this country. Some of us die for this country. So they're coming back fighting against the Jim Crow laws. 1920, then uh, 1920, you have the Okoye massacre in Florida. OK, 1920, which is uh, 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 the Klan is uh, fighting against African-Americans exercising their right to vote. 1921, you have the Tulsa race massacre, 1921. June 1st, 1921, 1923, you have the Rosewood massacre in Rosewood, Florida. OK, all this is taking place during this during the same period of time. And then you're going to have Negro History Week that is uh, uh, created in uh, 1926. OK, uh, the second week in 1926 by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. You have Negro History Week and he, he's uh, creating the Associated Publishers, Inc. Publishing Company to publish books by uh, African-American scholars and publish textbooks for our schools, things like this. All right. All this is happening. All right. Then we go on to uh, it, also in the 1920s, you have the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and the Klan is going to become very powerful. Once again, 1929, we have the stock market crash, October 1929, which cast the country into the uh, Great Depression. 
And but then we go into uh, uh, we're going to go into uh, Herbert Hoover, uh, who runs for president in 32. We go into uh, World War One, 1941 and 1945. Baby boomer generation, and then all these bills, the the, the New Deal that uh, the New Deal uh, bills, uh, the Minimum Wage Act of thirty five, Social Security Act of thirty five, GI Bill of uh, forty four, forty five, all these all these policies are going to be put in place, and a lot of these policies, African Americans are going to be locked out of various ways. Then after World War Two ends, then we're going to see the deindustrialization of the inner cities and the suburbs being built. And the 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 uh, the uh, Federal Housing Act of 1949 that allows white people to put three percent down on low interest loans and get houses built in the newly formed suburbs and the redlining uh, system that was enacted by the federal government and redlining is being used to discriminate against us from uh, buying uh, uh, homes in these uh uh, newly formed suburbs and oftentimes from buying homes in the inner city as well and buying property in the inner city. And the redlining system is being adopted by insurance companies and uh, banks. OK, so we're going to see how all this takes place. And it also locks us out of to a certain extent, locks us out of being able to buy homes and accumulate wealth and intergenerational wealth through home ownership also. Um, so let's see here. OK, then we go into the civil rights movement. 55 to uh, 1970. And then in 66, we have the Black Power Movement beginning. 1966 with SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and Kwame Ture and Willie Ricks, Mukasa Dada, okay, and the March Against Fear, June 26, 1966 in, in Mississippi. And then the Black Panther Party for Self Defense, founded in October uh, 1966, uh, Huey P. Newton and, and Bobby Seale. So we're going to each class. We're going to analyze approximately a 10 year period of time to get deep into this history and understand what happened and how we got here. We deal with, you know, Malcolm X and and Dr. King and and, and then Malcolm uh, leaving the Nation of Islam, March 8th, 1964. And and uh, uh, meeting Dr. King, March 26, 1964, and Malcolm in his hajj to Mecca, and then uh, uh, Malcolm for forming the Organization of Afro-American Unity and his By Any Means Necessary speech, June 28, um, uh, uh, 1964 also. So this is gonna be a very, very uh, important class. This is gonna be, are you gonna learn a ton of information in this class? Um, hopefully you learn something here. Um, from this preview, but you're going to learn a ton of information in this class. You can use this with your children also. All right. I would say the content is PG 13. You can use this with your children as well. And we're going to see how laws and policies shape conditions and how movements take place as a response to laws and policies and how all of this is connected. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power and resources and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments and treaties, their adoption, interpretation and enforcement. And um, racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race coming out of the ideology of European white supremacy. So once again, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You scroll down the page right on the home page. We have the information. You can register for this 10 week online course. Uh, it's going to be Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Uh, click right here on register here. It takes you to the next page. And then uh, on the next page, click on enroll. And as soon as you enroll, you can start. We have archived content that you can start watching. We have classes one, two and three of the um, uh, first 10 week online course that I teach called Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. In that class, we deal with thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Uh, so we have uh, classes one, two, and three archived there as a bonus uh, for you also. You'll also get the um, two and a half hour lecture that I did June 16th, 2021, dealing with um, the real history of Juneteenth. Okay, you're going to get that as a bonus. Uh, with this new online course also it'll be in digital download format um okay and then there was a 
uh, if you saw my show uh, recently, and we're on uh, Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time, and Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, the African History Network show, um, you, you may have seen a article that I that I dealt with um, that dealt with a wall that was built in uh, Detroit. Okay, it dealt with a wall that was built in Detroit, and this wall separated black from white. Okay, this wall separated black from white uh in, in detroit and it also segregated uh opportunity okay also segregated uh opportunity in detroit as well and kind of pull it okay yeah built to keep black from white discrimination coming from the federal government and then buying homes and things like this and another thing that we're going to deal with in the class is the uh, U.S. Interstate Highway Acts. The U.S. Interstate, another thing we'll deal with in the class are the U.S. Interstate Highway Acts in 1952 and 1956 that drove 41,000 miles of U.S. Interstate Highways all across the country. And it's gonna run through, um, it's gonna run through uh, about 1,600 African-American communities, okay? And it's also going to run through uh, Greenwood, the Greenwood District, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in 1970. Um, Interstate 244 and uh, US Highway 75. They're going to run through and, and, and wipe out uh, some of the remaining African American owned businesses and land's going to be taken by eminent domain. And we're going to see this happen all throughout the country. It happened uh, in Detroit. Uh, I 375 runs through uh, Black Bottom, uh, which was a residential district. And Paradise Valley, which was an entertainment district, a business district, is going to wipe out a lot of homes and businesses. But check out this piece here. This is about a 14 page article, uh, July 19th, 2021, from NBC News in conjunction with Bridge Detroit. It's fantastic reporting here. And one of the things it, it shows is how these laws and policies were put in place. And a lot of these policies coming from the federal government negatively. Uh, uh, impacting African-Americans, okay? All right, so follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Turn on live notifications so you know when we go live. If you like this uh, broadcast, just give us a thumbs up, click on the uh, thumbs up button also. Register for the online course, you posted the link here. And uh, you can also uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And all of my DVD lectures and digital downloads are at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for the uh, other online course as well, uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay, look, we have to get out of here. We'll see you um, in class uh, on Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Remember, right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. And we'll talk to you next time. Peace.